Our next presenter is Judy Parks, who is the Vice President of Mobility Mentoring Programs and Services at the Crittenden Women's Union. Um, and Crittenden Women's Union is a Boston-based provider. They do shelter, stabilization, job readiness, parenting, you name it, they do it. And they really have been a leader in taking what we've learned from brain science and particularly executive function and really trying to develop a program, an approach um, that uses that um, in programs for low-income families. Many of their families are homeless, so Judy will tell you more about who they are, what they do, and how they've used um, some of what you learned this morning and some other concepts um, to actually design their program. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Judy. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Um, I was always always apprehensive listening to Phil speak, speak that I was going to be able to follow along and not have to sneak out in the dark. Uh, it was, my talk follows right along, which is very good. Um, anyway, well, greetings from Boston, um, home of the Red Sox, world champions, and <laughs> put that in. Um, but also the third highest housing cost in the country. Um, so Boston has its ups and it certainly has its downs. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Crittenden Women's Union. Um, let's see if I get this the right one. Okay. Um, first of all, the mission of CWU, which is Crittenden Women's Union, um, is to, is our, our mission is to transform the course of low-income women's lives so that they can attain economic independence and create better futures for themselves and their families. Um, and so this issue of economic independence and, you know, again, and the work that Moles that you do in terms of workforce development go hand in hand. And our goal is to help families reach economic independence so that, and we define economic independence as being able to live without public supports. Um, so we really want to get families over that gap of earning just enough to lose all their benefits but not enough to actually pay their bills. And that is, that is our focus. Um, CWU is a very innovative uh, Boston institution. Um, we were formed seven years ago by the merger of two old Boston institutions that were, that were uh, founded in the uh, 19th century. The Women's Industrial Educational Union and Crittenden uh, Hastings House. Uh, both of them were, were uh, developed to help women who were moving from agrarian uh, uh, society into the city of Boston, help them get jobs. The Crittenden also provided home for those women who got in trouble um, in a, what was then a rural area of the city of Boston. But when the merger happened, um, what Crittenden, uh, Crittenden Union, has, uh, Union has, has done is to really strengthen um, the best qualities of, the, of the both institution. So we, we have a very interesting model of, of a sort of, a, of an action tank uh, in terms of the work that we do. We have programs, and we use the programs to, um, and we collect data from the programs. We have applied research in terms of looking always at the cutting edge of social trends and what's going on in, in, in new developments. And, and in public policy. And we, we activate these and we, we use them to feed each other so that the outcomes from our programs feed our, our public policy and advocacy. We're very much involved in make, trying to make policy change in the Commonwealth. Um, we, and that also builds on the research that we do and provides more information and, and more direction for the, for the research. So it's a very interesting model that way and it really keeps us, I think, on our toes and, in, and moving forward in a very, um, interesting manner. Um, what programs do we have? We have lots of programs, as Donna had alluded to, um, that are sort of traditional. We have um, tr traditional and supportive housing for homeless families. We're one of the largest providers of, sh of shelter for families in the state of Massachusetts. Um, we do some DV, uh, DV shelter as well. Um, we have workforce development, job readiness training um, in various kinds of programs. Um, we, are, we have a Healthy Families program, which works with very young parents, providing them with skills um, and parenting skills, as well as helping them get back to school and, and most times finishing their GED and, and be able to get back into the workforce. And then we have our newest program. We have our newest program, which is Mobility Mentoring Programs and Services. And these are our cutting edge programs using the, this, I would say, better living through science, uh, the, the, the executive functioning uh, information that we've, we've we transform into program um, design. The mobility mentoring programs that we have um, range from a very structured five-year program called Career Family Opportunity, um, which is a very intensive, um, requires a lot of commitment kind of a program for, for very selective group participants, to what we call a drop-in um, mobility mentoring program, which allows people to enter wherever they happen to be in their lives and start working on, our, on, our, on this scaffolding program that we have 
to sort of set some goals and move ahead and then constantly build on those goals. And we'll, I will talk much more about that as we, as we go through. Um, who, do, who do we serve? We serve the same people you do. Um, we have four, about 1,400 clients every year. Uh, 78 have high school education or less. Very, very low income uh, families. 96% um, are headed by single parents. Um, and this is very kind of, you know, reflective of the of part of the population of the city of Boston. Boston has about 635,000 uh, uh, residents. 47% are white, 22% are black, 18% Latino. We have, we're the sixth in the nation in terms of foreign born population. 20%, 27% of our population is foreign born. Um, we're fourth in educational attainment. However, if you look at the poor neighborhoods in the city of Boston, there's as many as 50% of the residents there don't even have a high school diploma. So we have those disparities. Um, and then if we were talking earlier about, about, about families with children, 85% um, uh, of low income families in Boston, again, are headed by single heads of household, again, mostly women. Um, our families, again, are the same families that you used to serve. They've, they've, they've experienced trauma, mental health issues, uh, DV. Um, again, very similar, kind of, I'm sure, statistics that you have here. Um, the 50% of the kids have, have been diagnosed with special needs. I, I have to be honest with you, for me, working in the, in the, in the development of the uh, mobility mentoring programs, I had not appreciated how many kids really have those diagnoses or need those diagnoses. So for me, that was a big aha moment. And as you all know, when parents have children with problems, they're dif it's difficult for them to work for them, th things for themselves because the kids always come first. In fact, and we were working uh, to select participants for our, this, the uh, CFO program, the constant um, reason we heard from, from women who wanted to join the program was, I'm doing this for my children. So again, it's very, very again, typical, I'm sure, for you as well. Um, We've talked a lot about brain science. I mean, I, I want to just to demonstrate that we are on the same page, um, that these are the skills that we think are very important based on the science um, that we've been, we've been assimilating into our programs. Again, this pausing to be able to, to step back and, and impulse control and think about what you're doing. Um, this set shifting, being able to look at alternatives and, and figure out you know, different, different options rather than just that constant, this is, this is the way that I always do something. Um, the ability to, to, to multitask and juggle complex tasks with, in a future-oriented way so that you can develop goals over a long time frames. Um, so that this is a very important, these are very important constructs in our program development. Um, again, we talked about this, the, the, the executive functioning skills, and we like to talk about those in developing this sense of agency so that where, where a person is able to, to know what they want to do to have the, or the awareness that they can initiate and execute those things. Um, and it's really an important, important part of our program is helping, helping people find that they have it or develop skills to build it. Um, and this really goes into that, that, that um, reducing the chaos in people's lives, that sense of power and control over the chaos. Because as we all know, everybody's life is, is, a, daily is a daily crisis that, that can derail all kinds of future plans. So we really want to work with people to develop the ability to step back and push that aside and have that sense of control for themselves. Um, we all know about this, the, the toxic stress of poverty. We've heard lots about that this morning. But to think about that, those skills that people, I, want, I shouldn't say skills, those pathways that people develop living under that, in that toxic mix that they, they, they've lived in, just actually gives them just the wrong skills that they need and the wrong kinds of, of executive functioning capacity that they would need to be able to get beyond that. So we really work at you know, developing scaffolding to help people get to that place where they can develop those skills. And again, I think as, and all of us have experienced times of extreme stress and your ability to make good decisions when you're in a very stressful place is not really very good. So if you think about doing that over the course of your life, it really leads you down a road that is not very successful. Um, and the other thing, too, I want to remind us all that the families we work, work with, they work hard. They juggle their kids, their jobs, if they're going to school, you know, their partners. I mean, they, they really work very hard. And, uh, and, the, and it's just um, the thing is that they work hard sometimes going in circles or going in the wrong direction. So our real goal in helping them build their agency is to help them break out of that and be able to move into something that, that gives them more control and gets them better, quite frankly, better economic outcomes. 
So in terms of our our uh, mobility mentoring um, and, and creating agents and these building these skills, we've come up with some very fundamental elements of what we think these programs need to have in terms of developing programs that build executive functioning and create positive outcomes for our participants. The first is, and we will show some more about this, the bridge to self-sufficiency. The bridge to self-sufficiency is CW's theory of change. Uh, it includes, uh, and we have it, in, at the, we ha we'll show a slide with it, includes working in, in the major aspects of your life, your family stability, your housing and your kids, your, your well-being, your personal and your mental health, your financial management, how you manage your finances and what your income and, and debt situation is, your educational attainment, where you are, what education do you have, has it been a good education, and your career development. So those are the things that we, that we the, the, the domains that we work in, and we've got this bridge, which I'll show you, which has various levels of where people are, and it's used both as an assessment tool, um, as a way of building scaffolding and showing that these five areas can be, are all connected and can then move up over time, um, and it's also used to help get with goal setting. Clear goal setting and outcomes measurement. It is really important for people to understand what they're trying to achieve. Because if they, you just say to someone, you need to get a better job, what does that mean? So we've come up with a very, some very concrete ways of setting program outcomes. So for example, in one of our programs, we actually have, have um, a study called the, the Mass Index, which is, determines what it costs to live in Massachusetts without public supports. So we will say to someone, this is the number. It's not around this number. This is the number that you need for your family composition to earn in, other to, in order to not live on public support and get past that, that cliff effect that we had talked about a little earlier. And then set the ability to set goals working toward those, those program outcomes um, that, are, that are clear. They're, they're, they're very specific steps in terms of getting in that direction. Um, tangible rewards. We are big believers in incentives. Um, and incentives can be all kinds of things, but with that, the incentives and the tangible rewards reinforce that I earned this, I did this, I accomplished this, and it's really important to help people develop that positive sort of um, reinforcement and feel better about what it is that they've been doing. Um, the EF skill building and coaching, that is an important part of the program. We talked, um, uh, my previous speaker spoke a little about the doing things repeatedly and, the, and the, all of those kind of things. That's what the, the skill building um, coaching entails. Those very clear goals. These are the things you're going to do. Uh, it's a co-investment. You're going to do this. I'm going to do that. We're going to meet. We're going to talk about this and have a very regular pattern of how we, how we work together. Um, peer support and, and, and uh, leveraging social networks. People can't live alone. And we'll find that most of our participants have very poor social networks. They're either very negative or they're non-existent. Um, and consequently, they really don't have the kind of um, someone to turn to when, they're, when they have a problem, which often leads to bad decision making. If you don't have someone that can help you out when your kid is sick, how are you going to hold a job? So you make, you make decisions that are based on that, that exact need without having to develop the, the capacity or, or to help people help, have people help you out. And a lot of them have actually gotten very bad skills in that area because they don't want to ask anybody because they've never learned how to ask anybody. So it's, it's a very complicated problem that we need to address. And leveraging networks. All of us know people that our kids know or we've all known that can help us. Many of our families don't have that. They just don't. So we, we really try to build that leveraging network, help people connect to people who know different things and experience different experiences, you know, can help them gain access. It's because a lot of this is about gaining access. Because when you're poor and you have all these problems, you don't have access. And we really want to help them get that. We have a definition of mobility mentoring and we call it the professional practice of partnering with clients so that over time they can acquire the resources, skills, and sustained behavior changes necessary to, to attain and preserve their economic independence. And we really believe that and all of this is infused throughout the programs that we've developed. So, let's see. So in terms of using um, this, this EF science and the, and the um, all the information we've had in terms of program design, how, how do we use this? So the first two here, program access and persistence and personal agency, are about sort of the, the setting of the program you want, you want to design. So first thing is in the recommended approaches, we want to, to break down barriers to entry, back, break down barriers to maintaining eligibility, and break down program silos. I'll talk about the funding in a minute. 
Because what's happened is everybody, all, all the services people have are accessed in silos, and there's never an ability to connect them together, to understand that if I work, just getting a job is not going to solve my problems. The rest of my life is in chaos. It's, you, we need to kind of talk about all of those things. So what we've done is we have, in terms of breaking down barriers to entry, we have low threshold drop-in programs that, 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 are, that are sort of the, the feeder into the more specific, longer term, more intense programming. But it's a way for everyone to gain access into, into this whole idea of building their skills and being able to do some goal setting. Um, we're very much in terms of uh, focus on this client-directed engagement. Uh, we want clients to get themselves engaged. So part of the process of this is to actually get people to feel like they are part of this. So we, we, look, we talk about this as being co-investment, that you, I'm not doing this for you. You're doing it for yourself, and I'm going to help you get the tools to do it. And we really believe that. We, we don't do for clients. We, we help them. We give them information. We lead them in the right direction. But it's really important that they learn to do it themselves. It, it, because most times, most of the services they get, people tell them what they're going to get or tell them what they're going to do. And that doesn't help anybody get anywhere. So we really want them to do the work. Um, this, the, the bridge that we use, again, is very much interconnected. We, uh, we, 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 we talk about that all the time. We never talk to anybody about just doing one thing. It's about how doing that one thing is important for, all, for, for the whole, whole uh, complex uh, part of your life. The funding, funding issue always gets very complicated um, because, unfortunately, lots of the public funding we have is always very specific around we do this and we measure this outcome. And so we've had to be very creative in terms of trying to <coughs> meld together different kinds of funding streams. We were very fortunate, quite frankly, in the very beginning when we started this work in 2009 to start it with private philanthropy, um, which gave us the flexibility to do um, program changes and do program development and, and uh, operation at the same time. However, we have also been working with one of the housing authorities in the Boston area, the Cambridge Housing Authority, which is a moving to work housing authority, and they have been able to be very flexible with some of their, their, their housing dollars and help us d d deliver some programming there at the, in the housing authority using some of their moving to work dollars. We've also done some uh, creative things, some workforce development group, combining that with some private philanthropy um, to, to do some of the other job readiness and more um, sort of work-focused, shorter-term uh, mobility mentoring programs uh, that, that we offer. But again, the, the funding streams and is one of the reasons that I, when I talked earlier about our three-legged sort of approach to, to work, the advocacy. It's really about getting public people in public policy to understand that, that this very specific funding which only addresses one very narrow part of someone's life, is the outcomes are never very successful because they're not, it's not comprehensive. So we use our outcomes and our data and our advocacy to really try to push uh, public policy initiatives within the Commonwealth. And we've been somewhat successful. We've got, we've got a good cadre of people who listen to us, and we've been able to make some changes. And in fact, as we speak now, we're trying to make some changes in the, in the, the new welfare law in Massachusetts um, to allow you know, longer periods of time for education to be counted as part of their, um, their work, work development. Um, this is your personal agency we talked a little bit about earlier, but it's about using mo mot motivational interviewing um, th and then this very, very intensive coaching uh, to, to, to deliver that. Um, but it's about really fo forming a program that is client-directed so that, that you, the client is very instrumental in determining what, what their outcomes are. Um, it's all about building frameworks for the client, helping clients make those decisions. Um, we, we often talk to our clients about you know, where they see themselves, so we, we, and we often say to them, we see you in a different place, because we really believe that, um, and we really want to help them start thinking critically about where they can get to. So this scaffolding and these, these, uh, the, these tools that we use, again, are really focused on building this executive functioning. It's this exterior scaffolding that we hang all the work on that becomes internalized for people so they can actually start doing some of this themselves. So we, it's, it's a very, again, concrete framework um, that has very uh, specific outcomes and expectations. Um, it, is, um, it requires that, that people understand being accountable, that you, you have to be responsible and accountable, um, and, but in a way that's, that is encouraging and supportive and helps build their capacity to do it themselves. Um, 
this goals framework is, again, this very important sort of outcomes, this notion that you're, you're setting goals within a context. There's a reason why we're setting these goals. We're trying to get from here to there. But also understanding that life is not a straight line. And a lot of times, there can be shifts, but that doesn't mean that you're unsuccessful. So just because you fail a class a semester doesn't mean you should drop out of school. It means that you have to step back, regroup, figure out what went wrong, retake the class and pass it. And we and we you often see on, on resumes or I'm sure uh, on other other information you get from your participants, your clients, they've been to school 15 times and they've they've never solved anything, never 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 finished. But it's because you get you get derailed and you don't have the ability to get back on on track. But if you know where you're going, it helps you get back on track. Coaching in this this uh, decision making is a very important part of our program. We um, we really create opportunities to um, reinforce the work that we do, this pause and reflect. Um, and we use, again, the bridge because it protects this, 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 this contextual um, uh, decision making. Um, but the coaching is, a, is really critical. And it's, it's, a, it's a relationship between the participant and the, and the, and the, men, the what we call the mobility mentors. Um, that is built so that, that it's a very open and honest relationship. And, I, and I'll talk about a few of the attributes of a good mobility mentor, someone who can help coach a person to develop these, these uh, EF skills. A person needs to be flexible. They need to be positive. You need to be a po have a positive attitude about working with participant. You have to be able to see them not as they currently are, but as they, as they can be. Um, you have to be their cheerleader. You have to encourage them, give them give them the strength to say that, you know what, I accomplished this, now I can do more. Um, you have to is, you're sort, of, sort of constantly upping the, 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 the level of intensity and the, and the difficulty of the, of the task. Um, you have to be focused and help them keep focused. You have to, we call it holding the frame. You have to keep people on track with what it is that they're trying to do. Um, you have to be honest. You have to tell people when something's not right or something is a decision that, that could be made better. But you have to be forward thinking. We never go back and look at what should have been done or what was done or whatever. It's about moving forward and learning from that. Um, because the, really, you can use the past to inform things, but you, you're not going to correct it. Um, having cultural sensitivity is very important. And being constant with a person and not wavering um, and just always being very clear about what it is that the person's trying to do. It helps with boundary issues and helps with a lot of other things, but be very, very constant a person in their life that's stable they can count on. Um, and also, our staff works as, as, as a team. And it's important to, to, to demonstrate that, because it helps the, the participant understand about, again, these peer networks, that people can work as a team and accomplish things together. Um, it's, it's really very um, valuable to the participant and also helps them build different kinds of relationships with different people in the program. So the bridge. I've talked about this bridge. So what is this bridge? This bridge is, is our theory of change. Um, and it's this scaffolding that, 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 that in a, and I can't, I can't stress how important this, this <coughs> visual is, which I'm going to show you right now, because it helps people see where am I and where am I going. And it helps when you're talking about where they are to see how one piece is interrelated to the other. And people take these home and they put them on the refrigerator. And they, people really, uh, our clients have really responded to this. Um, so we use this tool in multiple ways. It is the formation of, in the, of, of our programming. And it's used to um, demonstrate, you know, again, this theory of change that we have. We use it actively as an assessment tool. So we engage our clients with, in a conversation about where they see themselves on this bridge. So as an example, we will sit down and say, you know, what is your employment situation? I'm unemployed. Where do we want, where are we trying to get you? We're trying to get you a job that earns you, you know, economic independence, which would be a job with your, your mass index wage. And we go through all of these. And th this sometimes takes several hours. This is not a fast, oh, here you are, we're done. Because it, 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 it provides us with the basis for the goal making, the goal setting that we do. It provides us with lots of information about the participant. Um, the one thing I will say about our programs is that we are, we are a very data driven organization. Um, and so we do assessments in all areas of, of uh, people's well-being, their finances, their education, all those things. And we measure outcomes. We are very, very um, outcomes driven. And we use, again, as I said earlier, we use those outcomes to 
uh, inform our public policy, our research, and, and, to make, and to make changes. We also share the outcomes with the participants. A lot of times people, we collect data, we never share it with people. We share it in a very, you know, obviously in an aggregated way, but we share it so that people, the, the participants can see the progress that they've made and their peers have made. And it's very energizing. It's one, one number I always, always use because it absolutely is, is amazing to me. In our five-year CFO program, they're required to save $3,425 over five years, which is matched to give them $10,000, which is approximately three months of living expenses in the, in the Boston area. We have uh, participants in the, in the, in the program, and um, there are 45 participants, and there are participants who have been in the program as long as four years and some as short as six months, and they themselves have saved $60,000, not matched, just their money. And these are low-income women um, who have managed to do that, and it's truly um, amazing what, what you can do when you understand what you're trying to do and you set a goal to do it. Um, so it's, it's very, very powerful. So anyway, we do this assessment, and then we talk about where we're trying to get to. We, we have developed a, a, a plan of goal setting that we use six-month increments. We set goals with a participant that are over 12, 12 months, but in six-month increments. And we review those goals with, with participants on a very regular basis, often as many times more than once a month. And we require to meet with them at least five times a year so that we set goals, check in, then we do an assessment of the goals and we reset goals. But they always have almost you know, six months of goals ahead of them, so they always know when I complete something what I'm going on to next. And that is a really important uh, part of the program. And that was something that we learned in program development, that if you sit, set 12-month goals and then you never sort of reassess or you don't re keep resetting them, people get to the end of 12 months and it's like, now what do I do? So we really, we, we really very, very interactive process of setting these goals on a regular basis. Um, and it's very, it, it works very well for us and, and for the participants. And they, um, you know, they just, they can see the progress and they can see where they're trying to get to. So how do we set outcomes for our programs? We, we have a very, we, we have different levels of programming for mobility mentoring. Um, as I said earlier, we cast a wide net so we can get as many people as possible involved in these programs, and we call that level one. And in a level one program, um, like this mobility mentoring center, this drop-in center we have, the goals are usually set for a six-month period. Um, and, it's, and it's usually one or two goals for someone. Someone comes in, maybe they're in a little bit of a crisis mode, um, and we um, work with them to achieve some goals. They typically st start off with stability goals, trying to get them in a place where, so if their immediate goal is to get a job, if you don't have childcare, that's the first step. So it's trying to, again, put, lay the foundation so people understand that this is all about building on, on the things that you have to have in place in order to make progress. So we will, we will start with that. And then we don't require a big commitment from them. We just require that they meet with us, you know, work on the goals, and, 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 uh, and achieve them, obviously. Um, we then, if a person is successful and wants to go on beyond where they are, and we certainly encourage them by the bridge assessment and helping them with information, they can, they can engage with us for another, another year or, or, or sometimes longer. And then if they really are committed to moving ahead and want to engage in a long-term process, we will enroll them in a program like our Career Family Opportunity Program, where at the end of five years, they, the requirements are that they get a job that at its 75th percentile pays this mass index a self-sustaining wage, and they save this $3,425. But that program requires a lot of work. They have to meet with us on a regular basis. We have monthly group meetings. They've got smaller group meetings they have to attend to, and they have to be able to juggle family, work, school, because most of them wind up having to go to school and work at the same time. Um, so it's really important that they are ready to make that commitment. And we, th we've developed this feeder plan because it, it really does help us in terms of selecting participants who are ready um, to, to enter these more engaged, long-term uh, programs um, and be better success, be more successful at choosing, choosing uh, ones that can get positive outcomes. Um, one thing we have found in terms of working with the participants is that the role of employment plays a, is a very important indicator of people's success. Um, we have found in the programs like CFO, which again want this long-term program, that people who have never had, I don't call meaningful employment experience, 
were the ones who, who had the most difficulty achieving, achieving the outcomes. So this ability to get people in at the ground, set some goals early on and get them engaged and get them into employment, as well as having that, uh, that view that employment needs to be not just getting a job at McDonald's, but moving ahead with education and, and getting into a better job is a really critical step in terms of getting people um, engaged and, and making progress in their economic development. And again, you know, in order to sustain that job and hold that job, you need these executive functioning skills. So it's really important this whole, to, to meld together this scaffolding, this setting goals, this ability of, of, attain, of attaining goals, um, and working with their coach, the mentor, to, to develop those, those skills uh, in order to become successful. Um, and this shorter term engagement gives them time to build up some of the deficits that they may have in some of these areas so that they can be more successful in a longer term program. This Abbott House program that we're talking about here is an interesting one. Um, this is a, 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 is a homeless uh, shelter, um, which actually is, I shouldn't say it's a shelter, it's transitional housing. It's families who come from shelter. There are 12 families in, going into a transitional housing program. And this is one where, where funding becomes complicated. Um, the state of Massachusetts wanted this program to be all about economic development, but didn't want to make it a program requirement because it didn't match up with, the, with, their, with their voucher program. And we had to do a lot of very creative work with them so that we could select families that, to, to, that could enter this transitional housing program with these vouchers, but who also were very much keen on going ahead and getting to be economically self-sufficient. Um, this took a lot of work with the, with the Commonwealth uh, to get this done, but we managed to get enough criteria into the contract that we were able to select families as opposed to just taking families out of shelter. So again, sometimes the funding can be very arduous in terms of creating the program, but um, if, you if you persevere, you sometimes get your way um, because obviously the, the issue of economic development is very important um, to, to, to legislators in terms of understanding the value of the programs that they're investing in and this, in this idea of building on a return on investment on these investments in terms of people's uh, benefits. So that was a very interesting program. We have, we have 12 families in this. They're young families, and they are all, all of them are employed. All of them are now in school. Um, and they, again, have this mobility mentoring, executive functioning scaffolding as part of their, their, their ability to live in this development, in this, in this, in this building. Um, the the uh, building is run by, by a building mentor. They get referred to some of the specialists that we have at Crittenden, and it's um, been very successful. We've been operating for a year, and we were just very thrilled that we've got everyone working in, in, in school at this time, and they've all been paying their rent on time, so that was a big, big, uh, big step. Um, we talked a little bit again about this tangible reward, these incentives, um, and how important they are. And again, incentives can be all kinds of things. Um, they can be money, they can be recognition, they can be a hug. I mean, sometimes that's really all it really needs to be, is just to, just to celebrate with someone and be, I said, be their cheerleader and help them understand that they have accomplished something. Um, and this also, you know, I, the interesting thing about some of these things is that, that people learn them and they bring them home. So the idea of setting goals and giving incentives to their kids and doing all those things, we find lots of parents have done this, and it's been very, very successful at sort of trickling down. Um, again, this coaching, the mentorship, um, it's about we learn to resist those impulses, this whole idea of stepping back, don't hit the send button. That has been one of the <laughs> biggest challenges that we've had. Uh, we have um, our group, the, one of the, the CFO program, that one of the women in the group has a Facebook page, a CFO group Facebook page, and boy, I'll tell you, there have been a few things on there that have been early on, I should say. They don't they don't do it now, but that was that's been a big that's been a big uh, big challenge for us is to get people not to press the send button, um, and also not to not to contribute to the chaos because a lot of times, and you hear these conversations if people are on the phone or they're talking to people and there's these 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 conversations are just about chaos and people just add fuel to the fire and it's helping people understand that doesn't help anybody including yourself and step back. Uh, and not and not do that. There's a little mindfulness in this about being very deliberate in the things that you say and do. Um, and then also the, the understanding that you have options. We talked about agency earlier, but the idea that you don't have to do what someone has told you to do. You have decision-making capability. You have information. You have the ability to have options. And it's really important that people understand it because a lot of our participants don't. They just don't understand they have options. Um, and then and 
resilience that you, like I said earlier, you can fail a class, but you go back and redo it. That you, life is not about, you try one thing and you're done. Um, and again, you've seen on resumes, how many times people will tell you, well, I left that job because the boss didn't look at me the right way, or um, they didn't like the way I dressed. And so you have someone who's, you know, 40 years younger than me and has had more jobs than I've ever had, you know? I mean, it's just, it's that whole idea that you have to resist that and, and see your option and that resilience that you can, man, you can maintain those relationships and you can go back and you can fix it. Um, again, we talked some about the peer groups um, and we have um, several layers of groups that we have in our programs. We have one that's, we call them affinity groups. They're peer affinity groups. These have to happen in, in longer term programs and it, they, they, they are generated out of people relationships with each other. When we first started uh, doing this mobility mentoring, we tried to create those. And it was a, it was a bomb, I'll be honest with you. It was because people need to know, the, know each other well enough. And so the, 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 the groups that have developed out of these, these affinity groups have been, for example, parents of kids with special needs all got together and they hired an advocate to help with their, with their, with their kids and making sure their kids get the right kind of, um, of services in school. We had another group that were very concerned about their own levels of stress, and they got together and they, they go to yoga together, they take walks together, but they they they're they're organically generated and they come up out of people's relationships, and it's about helping them become positive. We do ask them to give us minutes of their meetings and things like that, just so we can keep a little bit of uh, data collection on that, um, but also so that we can help help them in terms of developing the leadership skills that they need to to keep these groups going and being viable. And again, these social networks, we. We provide them access within our organization to all of us. So if anyone is, is, a, is a participant at CWU and wants to talk to our CEO, they have access. And that has been so energizing for our participants who, you know, Beth will show up at a meeting sometime and, they, and the ability they can talk to our, our own, our real CFO about some financial issues. It's just that they see people coming in dressed in suits who will talk to them. Because a lot of times our participants feel like those people won't talk to them. So it's again about giving people the confidence and the agency to know that those people, the same flesh and blood they are, and they can and they can share some experiences with them. So we found that very helpful, and our board has been very instrumental uh, in helping us develop some corporate relationships. We have um, we have a, a session in our one of our workforce development programs where they do mock interviews and resume review with people at a at a law firm. So again, it's that access. We've had visits to to uh, manufacturers in the Boston area talking about job possibilities and in, in the setting of the, of, the, of, the, of the employer. So again, it's about, they're just so important to help people get uh, the confidence to know that they can do that. So yes, our families can do these things. Um, the programs that we have, they, people have had great results. Um, but you can see them here, I don't have to read them all off. Um, but the, the the fact that they were able to work and be successful. One of the other things that's not only gets on here is well, the, the um, increase of wages is really monumental to us because we're really about economic develop, um, uh, independence. But also, families who have transitioned out of our um, homeless shelters, oh, there it is, they, they retain their housing for more than 12 months. That is really important today because if you mess up on your rent and you've got a voucher, you're, you're done. So we really um, have given them and continue to support them with coaching around maintaining their, their, um, uh, their housing and, getting, and keeping their jobs so they, they can do that. So that, that's been a really very important um, uh, outcome for us, particularly in an area like Boston. I don't know the housing situation here, but in Boston, housing situation is, is critical. I mean, there are more, more families right now, homeless families in motels, than there are, in shelter, there are shelter beds. So it's, it's really a, a very critical problem in the Boston area. And for, for the CFO program, and this, is the, this was our first, again, mobility mentoring program um, that we developed, started in 2009. And this, this, is, this one is truly amazing. And this one is the closest to my heart since I put this on the ground. Um, but the fact that we have 83% of our participants have an associate's degree and 21 a, B, a BA or higher when they started off with just, just a little over uh, a, a high school diploma. A high school diploma was, a, was, a, was a, 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 an eligibility requirement for our program. Um, but, you know, a lot of them had tried before and had been to some of these proprietary schools, but the fact that they've been able to do this, and these, and these degrees are in areas that are job attaining degrees. These are, we are very focused on getting people into career tracks that will, where they can be employed. So these are not, you know, degrees in human services, um, because we try to steer people away from, 
you know, I want to help somebody. But again, it goes back to that sort of, you know, you, you do what you know. And so everybody knows that people help each other, you know, in human service. So we, but we work very hard to get people out of the human service arena, particularly if they have four children, because you can never pay your bills being a human service provider. But um, anyway, so very proud of that. Um, increased wages. I mean, again, we've gone, you know, we've had a $5 increase in wages, which is really a monumental. But people, remember, these are women who are both working and going to school. So for a lot of these women, this is not even their career track job. This is just getting a better job or, or capitalizing on the skills that they have not to walk into an employment like, uh, man, maybe, I, maybe I can get this job, but I'm, I'm good for this job and changing that confidence. Um, you know, again, their savings has gone up a whole lot. And we've had 10% people buy homes already, which there's, though that's the, four of the CFOs have purchased homes, and we have others who are sort of in the pipeline. And that has been unbelievable to us. Um, people have realized that if they take advantage and they have the confidence to go forward, that there are lots of first-time home buyer programs. We had someone who bought a, 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 um, a townhouse. She's paying less in her mortgage and insurance than she was paying uh, with her Section 8. So it's just giving people the information and the confidence that they can do that. Um, and that has been really important. And what's not on here, that, but, and we don't, it's, which is kind of hard to measure, is the level of drama has decreased dramatically <laughs> among the women in this program. I, it, it is really interesting to, because um, they are much more in control of their lives. They feel much more that they have personal agency. They can make decisions. And so the, the drama and the, and the hand wringing with the, with the boyfriends, a lot of that has gone away. It really has. Um, and that has been very interesting to us to, to kind of just watch that unfold. And also with their children, and we, this we do measure, but their ability to walk into a school and say, you know what, this is my IEP and I'm not getting those services for my kid, has really been, you know, it's been a pleasure to watch because they, people have made much better school choices. They don't feel intimidated by sitting in a room with a, with a principal, the social worker, the teacher, and feeling like they have nothing to say. They have something to say, and they know they do. Um, and those kind of, that kind of confidence building has been really, um, like I said, some of it's difficult to measure, but it is, it is truly a, a hallmark of this, of this work. Because again, we've given people the skills and the ability to you know, do those things. And again, I, we talk about, about the impulse control. A lot of times, I, when we first started, I hear people go, I told that teacher, and I was like, oh, that's not the right thing. But, you know, but, but again, the ability to learn not to do that. Um, or, or quite frankly, you know, I didn't open my kid's knapsack. Well, you should open the backpack, you know. It's that kind of stuff, to, to learn to do those things. So, you know, what have we learned? Um, we've learned that outcomes measurement is critical, um, and that it's important that, you, that if you, you set goals that are, and outcomes that are really clear, and that you measure the progress you're making toward them. It helps you run a better program. We've made changes in our program based on that. Again, it, it energized the participants, and it, and it really, and it's very helpful in terms of funding and, and making your case for public policy. Um, that this meaningful change requires co-investment. It's not you doing for people, it's them doing for themselves and helping them get the agency and the skills to do those things. Um, that working in silos really works against low-income families. They, they just, it's because, let's be honest, life happens in the fringes. And that, that sort of going from one place to another and that full-time job of being poor really gets you nowhere. Um, but that's this, this, this silo issue is something that you know, we, in terms of our access to policymakers and work that we do, are very instrumental in, in, in breaking down. Um, and then improving this agency and EF skills, it really improves people's families at all pillars of the bridge. Um, and that that's necessary in order to be successful. Um, so I thank you all for hearing me. Um, we have more information. We, I can give you information about our, our website, which is uh, liveworkthrive.org. We have lots of our tools there in terms of our, you know, this mass index, which you can use in, for, as a framework for your own. Um, we, publish our, we publish papers around the work that we do. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. think of it last time, but people should sort of say their name and where they're from. Hi, I'm Lisa Ritter from Goodwill East for Sales, Minnesota, and I would love to know how you um, find and recruit men mentors for the program, and then how long of a commitment and what type of training? Um, that's a very good question. 
Um, we recruit mentors. We have we have some obviously we have some eligibility um, uh, requirements. We like to find people who have had some experience working um, with families. Um, we all of our mentors right now have our, our MSWs um, and have had some experience. But when I say experience, it's been experience in different things. So for example, we have someone who did a lot of work with uh, with, with with kids with the. Uh, um, uh, that had dis the disabilities. We have someone who did a lot of work in workforce development with people who were post-incarceration. Um, I have an uh, extensive housing background, so we like to find people who've had experience in the various areas that our participants would be, would be working in, um, uh, trying to achieve goals in. We, the attributes that I talked about are also very important. When we interview for mobility mentors, we really, it's, it's about who they are as a person that is very important to us as well um, because we really, and I, and I want to stress how much this, this idea of being positive about their participants is really important because, I mean, let's be honest, sometimes all of us get a little jaded working in this field, and it's really important to have someone who can, can get beyond that. We do lots of training. We actually have a 12-week mobility mentoring training that we do that works um, in, in, in terms of the theory of, the, of the, we, we have some brain science in there, the changing face, uh, 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 face of poverty right now in terms of this, this income gap and the and the ever-growing educational gap that we have in the country. Um, we talk about boundaries, helping people work at work and not be caught up in people's lives, so, which is one of the reasons that we work in a team a lot. We work in a team. Um, so it's it, people who are very motivated in that respect, people who have done some, some that have worked with data and understand the importance of, of data collection, not as a way of measuring outputs, but as a way of measuring outcomes. Um, so that, that's really very important to us. We have a fairly extensive um, uh, uh, interview process, and, and, I'm, and I'm really good at poaching, I'll be honest with you. I uh, poached a lot of good people <laughs> from other programs. Um, but sometimes that's what you have to do. Um, but it's, it's, it, but interviewing and, and choosing mobility mentors is very important. And in terms of commitment, we've been very fortunate that the, the, um, as an organization, we've made a commitment to staff that encourages longevity. Um, but also promotes people to move on when it's time for them to move on, um, particularly younger people. But we, the, the mobility mentors we have, all have been in our, been working with us at least four years. Um, in the in the in the two women who worked with me when we when we started the very first mobility mentoring program, um, we all agreed that we would stay at least to the end of the program because we felt it was very important for ourselves professionally as well as for the, the our participants to be there through the whole time with them. I think people often think of mentors as volunteers, but the paid mobility staff. mentors are their paid They're staff. They're paid staff. Um, and often would, and maybe in some other programs, would be referred to as coaches, but. Yeah, that's uh, true. So different. Yeah, yes. Okay, over here. Uh, hi, I'm, I, I just thought it was also. Okay. Okay, let me start with the recruitment. Um, we, we recruit from our own programs, obviously. We have a shelter, we use that. But we also have partnerships with lots of other organizations in the Boston area. Um, and actually, we have done some training of some staff. We actually have a mobility mentoring program in another organization that their staff um, is running that we've trained. Um, we've used the, the, the public housing authorities as a good places for recruitment because we the one thing we have found, um, particularly for the more intense levels of engagement, is if people have uh, stable housing, it's very, very uh, beneficial in terms of them being able to move forward. Um, people who have housing challenges often have to focus on those first, and we're trying to focus on moving beyond that. So we've done a lot of work with housing authorities in terms of recruiting, with their, working with their, their uh, housing managers, um, and having our staff available. In, the, in Cambridge, we actually have a staff person who's seated at the Cambridge Housing Authority and works with the recertification process to get people referred. Um, we do lots of outreach. So when we're, for example, working, we started the, this, uh, this, the first program in South Boston, which is a place that we had very little uh, presence uh, in the city of Boston. So we did a lot of work with the other agencies there 
um, informing them of what we were trying to do and that we were not trying to usurp their clients, but trying to engage their clients to better use their services. Um, and that's, that was fairly successful. And I will be honest with you, the, the most success we've had has been word of mouth. That once we get up and established, we now have waiting lists for our programs and it's mostly been from our, from our participants. And the second part of your question um, was, do you just want to ref Yes. What we've done is that the outcomes, um, for example, the more intensive programs have very specific outcomes. That drives the eligibility so that we wind up with people in the program who are very much in tune with the program outcomes. So we have a high school diploma, um, have to have stable housing, those kind of things. And then we have a, 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 an interview process that determines their readiness. So I think readiness is kind of what, the, what, we're, what we're talking about here, is how, is how do we judge a person is ready? How do we get them into these programs? Um, so for, we start with this, this more, again, wi wide array of, of, of participants. Um, and we say client-directed goal setting. We, what we do is we want them to tell us why they want to be in the program. So for example, you know, get a job is a very good example of that. I'm here because I need a job. And then we work with them to, to sort of deconstruct that and figure out why it is they don't have a job, what things are going not in the right direction for them to have a job, what jobs have they had if they've ever had a job. And so use that to help them understand how they need to build their own goals to attain that, that outcome of getting a job. So that's how, when we say client-directed, we mean that. We use the same tools, the same bridge, the same assessment, but we really focus on what it is that their goal is. So for example, we've had people tell us, I want to be a massage therapist. Well, being a massage therapist in Boston is not going to let you pay your rent. So you're going to have to help them deconstruct you know, why you want to be a massage therapist and why you want to do those things. And I mean, why, why you think you can, you can be successful at that. And sometimes you've got to give people a little rope. You have to give them a little, a little bit of the ability to, to move ahead in a direction that may not be exactly the direction you need them to go in. But you have to, again, help them develop those skills to be critical about thinking that I've gone this far. Is this really going to get me where I'm, I want to be? Um, so we really, and that's why I said about holding the frame. You have to help them within this, this the program outcomes move ahead. But sometimes you get off and veer off, but you can't let them go over the edge. Yes. Um, the first, the first question about the data. When we started the this very intensive five-year program, CFO, uh, it was costing us about ten thousand dollars a year per participant. But that included program development costs because we had a program design, but we were operationalizing a design, and so we had we had a very small staff and a very small group of, of participants. Right now, we're, we're, we're thinking that five thousand dollars per participant per year um, is what the cost would be. Now that also includes uh, cash incentives and, and a match savings. Um, but we figured that the participant load that a, that a mobility mentor can handle in a long-term intensive engagement is about 25 to 30 participants. Um, and in the shorter term, um, more drop-in short-term level one, level two engagements, it's about $1,000 to, to, to two, three thousand dollars a year depending on if you want to layer incentives and layer a, a match savings program on top of that. Um, in one of our programs, we have layered uh, an incentive program on, uh, 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 on on top of the program, and the other we have not because we didn't have funding to do so. Um, but those are, those are pretty much the, the average cost per year. And again, in this low-level engagement, we have um, about 50 or so participants that can be, be uh, uh, in the client load. Um, we also we, we utilize another, another uh, kind of mobility, we call them mobility specialists at, our, in, in, at Crittenden, which are is an academic specialist, a financial specialist, and a career specialist. And again, those are services you can find in the community. I mean, you can and and work with them. Um, we happen to have them in house, so they get easily easily coordinated into our goal setting. Um, we've worked with an organization in New Bedford, which actually outsourced all of that. Um, but then you have to you have to account for the coordination piece of of, of making sure all of the stuff is constant. Yep. Oh, they, they are. are 
Yes, yes, it's, that's external to our cost. We work with an organization that does provide some scholarships, and we are a big proponent of the community college system in, in, in the Commonwealth um, in terms of helping people have low cost or no cost education. Um, we have had some, 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 of our, some of our participants go on to four year schools that have gone and, and have accumulated some debt. We are, we are very mindful of school debt. Um, very mindful of school debt, and we actually work with the, cons with the, with the Conservation Law Foundation around some work on that, um, and uh, about about making sure people don't get get taken with that. But you asked about ROI. We actually, for this five-year program, have a contract with Brandeis University, who de has developed a um, method methodology around tracking the cost and benefit analysis for this for the for the CFO program for both South Boston and Cambridge. Um, and our indications have been very good so far. Now, the, the program has not completed a cycle yet, um, but we collect lots of information data because, to be honest with you, our whole purpose for the ROI study is to demonstrate that if you make an investment upfront in, in families, that the, RO, the return on that investment is actually great. And, and so far, indications have proven that, that, that it, we're going in that, in that direction, which is one of the reasons that we wanted people in subsidized housing because that was a very big fixed cost. So we track thing benefits, cash benefits of housing, uh, TANF, um, food stamps. Um, well, we have we have we have uh, healthcare in Massachusetts, so healthcare costs and childcare costs. Okay, I think we should move on to the next um, panel. And um, Judy's going to be around all day, so if you have questions for you, you can. So.